Uh, hi there, everybody. Welcome to Liberty.me Live. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, filling in for several options, all of whom are, are unavailable, but I'm here, and more to the point, Sheldon Richmond is here, um, and we're going to have a good talk about the poison called nationalism. That's that's the general uh, sentiment here. So thanks for coming, Sheldon. Great to be here. Thank you for for hosting. Um, I'm going to give you guys a brief Sheldon Richmond does good stuff uh, biographical summary. He's the vice president of the Future of Freedom Foundation and editor of the monthly journal um, Future of Freedom. For 15 years, he was the editor of The Freeman. Too many freedom words here for um, for fee, Foundation for Economic Education, so that's good. Um, he's, his column is reposted on Reason weekly, which I think is a good blow against libertarian uh, factionalism. Um, and kind of personal note, slight fawning, he's, he has written some essays that have changed my thinking on a lot of things, including, hey, wait a minute, the mentally ill should have civil liberties, and immigration is not a moral crime, and just like lots of things. So I'm excited and slightly nervous to be here. Um, <laughs> He's done other good things too. Many long bi biography. Um, so what we're going to do here is basically Sheldon's going to talk for about 20 minutes, but honestly, as long as he likes is fine about um, some of his recent writings about nationalism, about sassing the cult of Chris Kyle, the American sniper, and things like that. Um, I'm going to let Sheldon take it away, and he can stop whenever he likes. And after that, we're going to do questions. So take it away, Sheldon. Well, thank you, thank, and thank you very much for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm honored to have you as a friend, Lucy, and uh, and so I'm very uh, pleased that you're uh, you're hosting uh, tonight's session, and I hope it maybe it'll be the first of uh, many. So, thank you for that. Uh, yes, I, I I've been thinking about nationalism for quite a while, but it I really uh, put my mind to it uh, over the last few weeks with the uh, Oh, all the publicity about uh, Chris Kyle, the American Sniper movie, of course, his book uh, from a couple of years ago, which uh, is back in, uh, in everybody's uh, mind because of the book, because of the movie, the Clint Eastwood movie. And so uh, I'd done some writing, shorter writing, op-ed uh, length writing on uh, Kyle questioning uh, his status as an uh, as American hero, which everyone, every, everyone uh, kind of in the outside world, outside the libertarian uh, uh, world, uh, was wanting to uh, wanted to bestow, bestow on him, and the uh, the response was uh, was actually I was surprised by how nasty the response was. It wasn't just people trying to refute me, but people who thought it was a much better response to call me names and wish me harm. Uh, not that I want to make myself a, a victim. I'm not a victim, but I just thought it was uh, fascinating that I got that kind of response. So I I, I decided to set my thoughts uh, that down on uh, on nationalism. Uh, and uh, I, I want to begin with a, uh, an 1854 poem, which uh, everyone has at least heard some of, uh, by Alfred Lord Tennyson called The Charge of the Light Brigade. It's about the uh, exploits of a, uh, of a military unit, British military unit, uh, during the uh, Crimean War. And there's one stanza that's, uh, that's uh, fairly well known, at least a couple of the lines uh, are, are fairly well known, and I thought it was a suitable way to, uh, to open this discussion. Uh, and it goes like this, forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed, not, though the soldier knew someone had blundered, theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do or die, or sorry, do and die, into the valley of death, the road the 600. Uh, Tennyson, of course, was a defender of the British Empire, and, and this poem which, which goes on for several stanzas, uh, uh, is not critical of the idea that the soldier does not make reply, reason why, but just does or die. Uh, this, he thought, was a, go a good thing, the fact that the soldiers were willing to do this. So that's how it brings us into the subject of, of, uh, of nationalism and, uh, and all these surrounding uh, uh, matters right now, the, the center on uh, Chris Kyle. So I think the reason for the venom, and that's probably the best word that, that was directed at people who uh, were critical of uh, the uh, status of Chris Kyle as a, as a hero, uh, can be summed up in that word nationalism. So in my view, nationalism is a poison. Uh, 
it attacks the mind, short circuits uh, one's thinking, and makes self-destruction look appealing. Uh, nationalism sows the seeds of hate and war. It makes the title warrior and honorific instead of the pejorative it ought to be. Um, we see naked, ugly nationalism in many defenses of, of Kyle. Uh, defenders appear to have but one operating principle. And I and I, I base this on the on the you know, hundreds of twi tweets and and, and uh, uh, emails I got. I mean, I, so I, I, the empirical evidence came to me. I didn't have to go out and search for it. Uh, defenders appear to have but one operating principle: if Kyle was an American military man and the people he killed were not Americans, then he was a hero. Full stop. No other factors are relevant. Uh, it matters not that Kyle was a cog in an imperial military machine that waged a war of aggression on behalf of the ruling elite's geopolitical and economic interests, uh, that he did his killing on foreign soil, and that no Iraqi had come to the United States seeking to harm uh, him or other Mer Americans. Contrary to what Kyle defenders uh, and or Kyle himself uh, uh, seemed to believe, not one Iraqi was among the 19 hijackers on 9-11, Although, had that been otherwise, the murder of countless other Iraqis and the displacement of millions of others uh, would not have been justified. Uh, all that apparently matters to many Kyle fans is that his, uh, this man was born in America, joined the American military, and faithfully obeyed orders to kill people um, he called savages. Uh, that is what nationalism does uh, to a human being. The ugliness of nationalism is often perceptible, even uh, to those who harbor it and commit terrible actions as a result. So they have to rationalize what they're doing. They don't openly cheer the killing of Iraqis because Iraqis were Arabs or uh, are Iraq. They don't, they don't cheer the killing of Iraqis because they are Iraqis or Arabs or Muslims. Rather, they plead self-defense. If we don't kill them, they will kill us. Uh, Kyle actually says that, in the, at least in the movie. Uh, Kyle and his comrades were defending America his defenders will say, uh, and Americans' freedoms. But if you've seen The American Sniper, the movie uh, based on Kyle's book, uh, you heard Kyle's wife uh, reject that claim. And I'm surprised that this bit of dialogue um, has been ignored, at least to my knowledge. I've read quite a bit uh, about the movie in the book, but I haven't seen this, uh, this one scene discussed uh, in the voluminous writing uh, about the movie. As Kyle gets ready for yet another of his four tours in Iraq, his, wife, his unhappy wife, they already have one small child, and I think another one's on the way at this point, his unhappy wife, wife asks him why he's going back, and he says, for you, well, close quote. And by extension, I take that to mean for America. Uh, and she fires back, no, you're not, uh, which I thought was very interesting. He also invokes the welfare of the Iraqis, although in his book he says he cared nothing for the Iraqis. So that's uh, something that the, uh, the movie makers have added. He tells his wife that being away from home for another long stretch would not be a problem because their family could spare the time and the Iraqis uh, could not. Uh, but she doesn't buy that line either. So, uh, she's deeply disturbed that uh, her husband would rather try to fix Iraq as though he and his comrades could actually do that through military force uh, than look after his own family. It's curious that uh, uh, Kyle's wife, if this, if this scene actually took place, a lot of the scenes in the movie, uh, we should know by now, movies that are claim, that, that claim to be based on history <laughs> usually are mostly made up. Uh, it, but it's interesting that she had a clearer picture of the world than Kyle's vitriolic nationalist defenders who praised the sniper for following orders without question. One even uh, provingly quoted uh, uh, or uh, alluded to Tennyson's poem uh, without any sense of irony. A lot of people will tell me he didn't, uh, Kyle didn't make the policy. He was just obeying orders and no sense of irony whatsoever as if they'd never heard of uh, Nuremberg, for example. So if not for nationalism, such contortions, the, con the conjuring of imaginary threats, the conceit in aspiring to save society, a society one knows absolutely nothing about, the twisting of the warrior's ways into virtues would be unnecessary. Things could be called uh, what they are. Someone who swears an oath that in practical terms obliges him to kill whomever the current White House occupant tells him to kill, asking nothing about the justice of the cause, would be called a, a cold-blooded contract killer rather than a hero. Nationalism, to judge by how nationalists conduct themselves, is an unswerving religious-like devotion to the nation construed as a quasi-mystical uh, entity, Amer America, 
that cannot be wrong and so has the authority to command reverence and obedience. The nation transcends uh, particular political office holders, but the government or state is integral to this entity. The nation or country cannot be imagined without the state. It would not be the same thing. When an American nationalist thinks his country, he, he thinks not merely of a land mass with, a distinct, with distinctive features, uh, the people, a diverse group, uh, of course, and its history, a mixed bag, because that list does not fully capture what he means by America. To the nationalist, government represents and expresses the will and sentiment of the nation. To be sure, nationalists can think that the people have erred in picking their leaders, in which case the nation is misrepresented and has to be, quote, taken back. <clears throat> the power of compartmentalization allows some people who think of themselves even as individualists to think of themselves as individualists uh, while seeing the nation in these corporate terms. Let's remember that this quasi-mystical entity, the nation, is what it is only because of countless contingent, contingent effects, uh, events affected by human beings. The United States did not begin with 50 states, of course. Had events gone differently, it might have included some or all of Canada and none of what was once part of Mexico. It might have uh, been without the Florida Territory and the 828,000 square miles that constituted the Louisiana Purchase. The current boundaries were the result of often bloody human action, not, but not entirely of human design. So it was with other nations. At one time, there were no nations as we think of them today. There was fairly recent development, late uh, uh, 18th and into the 19th century, was the nation actually, as we know it, begin to form. <clears throat> the, uh, the French uh, uh, writer of uh, nationalism, er Ernest Renan, uh, said in a famous 1822, 1882 lecture, What is a Nation? Quote, forgetting, I would even go so far as to say historical error, is a crucial factor in the creation of a nation, uh, which is why progress in historical studies often constitutes a danger for the principle of nationality. Indeed, historical inquiry brings to light deeds of violence which took place at the origin of all political formations. Unity is always affected by means of brutality. Uh, by the way, uh, Ludwig von Mises praises Ronan and this lecture in his book, uh, Omnipotent Government. This integral relationship between nation and state is why nationalists reject claims that one can love one's country while despising uh, the government. Uh, that's impossible by their definition of the country. Of the, of country. To oppose the government is to oppose the country. You may oppose a particular president, but don't dare oppose the military. <clears throat> now, you can try to redefine country to make it something properly lovable, but you won't persuade the nationalist. It's no accident that governments never fail to call on their flocks to love their country, by which they mean be willing to make any sacrifice on its behalf with sacrifice defined by politicians. Instilling nationalism is always the primary mission of, uh, say, uh, government and its schools, because as Ernst Gellner wrote in Nations and Nationalism, quote, it is nationalism which engenders nations and not the other way around. So uh, let me repeat that because that's I think that's a very interesting point. It's nationalism which engenders nations and not the other way around. If we look at how na how modern nations have, have been founded, the European nations, for example, they began in uh, many cases as separate states, uh, sometimes that warred with each other. Uh, Germany, uh, French uh, provinces, uh, Italy, Greece, uh, and then at some point they're united by, uh, by usually by some strong charismatic figure. We have Bismarck in uh, Prussia, and then Germany and Garibaldi in Italy. Uh, once the once the legal nation is created, the next step for these founders is to instill a sense of nationalism in the people who are now the citizens of this of this new entity. And they have to convince them that they actually belong together, that they all go back to some ancient time, right? The, the Italians all went back to, to Rome and, and, uh, and so on and so, so forth. The story is repeated over and over again. Uh, when Italy was, was united in the 19th century, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Italian statesman who uh, was involved in that unification, uh, Massimo uh, D'Azeglio, uh, said the following thing, which is very revealing. He said, Italy has been made. In other words, the legal entity has been created. Italy has been made. Now it remains to make Italians. Because the people didn't think of themselves as Italians. They were Sicilians, or they were this, or they were that. And But the job of now the leaders was to get them to stop thinking that way 
and uh, think of themselves as Italians. Only then would there really be Italy. And a similar thing happened in the United States, of course, where uh, citizens, uh, people thought of themselves as citizens of the particular states. Patrick Henry says, uh, Virginia is my country uh, at one point before the Constitution uh, was ratified. And once the Constitution, uh, through the ratification process, and then once it was ratified, uh, the, the, the really staunch nationalists like Alexander Hamilton uh, knew that their job was to create a, a consciousness about uh, America, you know, being a citizen of the United States of America, not a citizen of Virginia or, or Massachusetts or Pennsylvania. So this is a process we find repeated over and over again. It actually happens also in the, in the modern state of Israel. <clears throat> so that mission, this creation of a national consciousness, is behind the near compulsory recitations of the Pledge of Allegiance, written by an avowed uh, collectivist, by the way, uh, salutes to the troops for their service on any and every occasion, and the playing of the national anthem and other nationalist songs at sporting events. It's what's behind the repeated compulsive assurances that, quote, America is the greatest country on earth, close quote. The ruling elite understands that love of country will inevitably, fi inevitably find its application in fealty to the government, no matter what uh, dissenters may say. Now, some wish to distinguish nationalism from patriotism, but I, I don't think this works. Uh, pay, the word patriot has a lineage that includes the Greek words for fatherland, uh, that would be patris or patris, uh, one of, uh, one's of one's fathers, patrios, and father, pater. Uh, this in indicates the country's uh, parental relationship uh, to the citizen. And it can't simply mean the land of one's fathers because people believe they should feel patriotic about lands their fathers never set foot in. Uh, hence, my definition of patriot, one who, no matter what the difficulties, places power above party. I understand the love of the place one uh, knew as a child. I understand the love of home, of family, of community, of neighbors, and of people with whom one has shared experiences and beliefs. I understand the love of virtuous principles as expressed in historical documents, such as the Declaration of Independence. That kind of love does not ignite hate for the other or create admiration for the warrior who enjoys killing the other on order. That takes the poison of nationalism and an obsession with the nation uh, it creates. So I will uh, stop at that point and uh, hope we have a good discussion. I hope I said enough to provoke uh, some conversation. You Take did. Um, <laughs> oh man, you. The progression of that. There's like too much. I want. I want to pick your brain about, and I don't know where to begin. Starting off with okay. war poetry and my urge to now go read lots of Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen poems, and how Tennyson or anyone else could possibly be non-ironic about um, the charge of the Light Brigade, because just the idea that that poem is supposed to be a positive is rather. Horrifying. Um, all right. I should, do you want to see? We start with a couple of our um, our questions and put uh, ask more of them, audience, humans. Mm -hmm. Our first one is simply: Has U.S. nationalism run amok? Um, which seems <laughs> yes, but elaborate. Yeah, that well, that seems like an easy one. Uh, I, I would say so. Uh, you know, look, every every na while while I identified, I think a common thread with with uh, uh, lots of nations. Uh, every nation is also unique, has its own story, its own history, and, and America's is very interesting in this regard because we have this sense of American exceptionalism, right? Uh, uh, the rule the rules are different uh, for America. Uh, we're the indispensable nation, as neocons like to say. Uh, and if you go back to the the founding. Uh, of course, in a sense, it was exceptional uh, because there's this revolution, right? That uh, and 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 the, the uh, parting with the uh, most powerful empire of the time, uh, and of course, a lot of good things were said. There's there's great sentiment, of course, in the uh, Declaration of Independence, and other and other people were saying things that we as libertarians can uh, get excited about, and and uh, we still take those principles seriously, even if we're doing the only maybe the only group that does. Uh, but you can see how there could also be an, uh, a dark side to that sense of exceptionalism, that we need to now bring this to the world, not simply by teaching or being an, ex an example, but actually really bringing it, you know, with uh, like a global navy, which, 
you know, before, look, before 1820, the U.S. is already build, busy building a global navy, which Madison and James uh, Monroe and John Quincy Adams are intent on having uh, to open up markets, to extend U.S. influence, and and uh, and, and just in the name of national security, because they 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 felt they were. Uh, endangered by everyone who didn't have a Republican society, right? All the monarchies ar around the world, they, uh, these American leaders or rulers, whatever term you prefer, uh, thought those constituted a threat to national security. They didn't use the term national security. They just talked about security and safety, but it was the same idea. So uh, this is not a new thing with uh, nationalism running amok. I mean, uh, they had to conquer the, the continent, right? So what did they do? They wiped out the Indians. So when they, when they, if they thought the Indians wouldn't integrate themselves into our into our form of society, the idea was they got kicked off the land and then pushed uh, pushed further and further away and then and then slaughtered. Uh, that was nationalism run amok. So it's not a new story. I think I think, uh, I think it has run amok. It's you know maybe it's waxed and waned at different times over our history, but. Uh, uh, if you look at what the U.S. has been doing in the Middle East and the Muslim world generally for, you know, since World War II, uh, it's hard, it's easy to make a case that, uh, yeah, this is nationalism more than what. Um, we'll get some more questions and keep asking them. Something that comes to my mind, though, is something I've been thinking about lately. It comes to mind if you, you know, try to rehash World War II, which I can't resist doing. Um, Anthony Gregory taught me to do that incessantly. Um, and obviously today, with ISIS becoming more and more, you know, disturbing. I think the, the fact that e even you or I, anyone here, would, would, ra would rather live under the U.S. government than Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan or ISIS. And that simple fact somehow makes everything else, well, I mean, they're fighting against those guys and we don't want to live under those guys. And so I think, like, the inability to risk... What they see is risking our safety because they think, you know, aggressive war is somehow ensuring our safety. Those others are not worth any risk to our safety. So we have to fight them so they can never come and take us over, if that makes sense. Well, that's what a lot of people think. I mean, uh, uh, in the movie, Kyle is shown talking to a uh, uh, somebody in his unit uh, who's sort of questioning why we're there. You know, why, why are we here? And he says something like, uh, do you want to fight them in San Diego and New York? And that's the end of the conversation. The guy, the other guy's not even given a chance by the scriptwriter or by the director to make any kind of re response. Uh, now, I don't, you know, we don't need to talk about the movie uh, as a movie. I'm not, I'm not a, uh, an expert in filmmaking uh, or, you know, I'm not a critic. So, uh, but I just point that out because a lot of people uh, thought that. But the question is, you know, what is the reason to think that? First of all, we need to point out, and I, I'm, I'm getting tired of saying this, not in this group, but I mean, I just write it, I've written it so many times. There was no ISIS or Al Qaeda in Iraq or Syria before the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Uh, Al Qaeda was a relatively small group of people in Afghanistan. Now we can push our back our analysis and go back to when the U.S. was. Uh, and Zbigniew Brzezinski brags about this when he lured, helped to lure the Russians into Afghanistan, and then we threw a lot of money under uh, Carter and then Reagan to uh, the Mujahid, what was then affectionately, affectionately known as the Mujahideen, the freedom fighters who were fighting, who were Islamists fighting the, the atheistic communist Russians. We liked them then. Um, and, and bin Laden was benefiting from that. I'm not saying the U.S. was directly uh, aiding bin Laden. I don't think that is the case. I haven't, I haven't seen a convincing case for that, or that the CIA, you know, was knowingly giving money to, to bin Laden. I don't think that's true. But he had to be benefiting, nevertheless, from what the U.S. was doing in Afghanistan. So, uh, and, then, and then meanwhile, the U.S. was doing lots of other things. I mean, uh, we need to fight this idea that many people have, is that, hi that history began on 9-11. You know, people, when I say... Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, when, when at this I point, that was so long ago. <laughs> well, that's right. And people have this idea that anything before that is ancient history and was irrelevant. All the we only start the analysis from the day that an American is killed, right? Uh, <laughs> nothing could have happened. Nothing serious could have happened before that. So don't talk to me about that. But when I talk about 2003 and the invasion of Iraq, uh, people will say to me, 
wait a second, they hit us in 2001, so how can you say all the trouble began in 2003? Well, I didn't say all the trouble began in 2003, but all the trouble didn't begin in 2001 either. The U.S. had already, first of all, in the 90s, was starving Iraqi children. Okay, there's the famous story of, uh, uh, as everybody probably knows, of uh, Madeleine Albright being on 60 Minutes saying, uh, uh, being asked if uh, the death of uh, half a million Iraqi children is worth it, quote, worth it, meaning, is it worth it? Uh, is that the is that price a good price to to try to drive Saddam Hussein out of office uh, power? And she said, Yeah, we think it's worth it. Well, easy for her to say. When any her kids, uh, you know, you have no doubt that 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 clip was played all over the Middle East. That was in the '90s, well before 2001. That's the kind of thing that motivates someone to want to fly planes in the buildings. I'm not justifying the killing innocent people in office buildings, but you can see why that would make people mad. And, and, and people who have a sense of powerlessness may think that's the only thing they can do. That's not the only thing we've done, of course. We've, su we've supported the oppression of the Palestinians. Uh, people were mad. You know, just go back and read uh, bin Laden's declaration of war. It's online that he issued in the 90s. We had troops near the holy places in, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, which, which he and others found very offensive. Uh, starving of uh, Iraqi children through the embargo and also uh, bombing of Iraq uh, in the 90s, and then the Palestinian question. So uh, I probably have uh, strayed from the original question. <laughs> it was but, more uh, just this is something. This is something people don't know. They think they think mm -hmm. like I said, history begins the day an American gets hit. That's so quotable. I really want to just write that down right now because that's and that's nationalism run amok. If you think about it, to go back to the original question. <laughs> Indeed, it is. All right, let's let's try another one. The people demand this question. Let's see what it says. Um, Bud Wood asks: Ancestor memory is a powerful force, and it typically says that different people are threats. Hence, that emotional force can direct person's actions. It is all well and good to intellectualize that force, but it is what we use in our living. Lost me a little at the end there. Um, I think the general idea, I mean, the, the, the othering of, of the people far away, who couldn't possibly be motivated by, you know, saying that killing lots of children is worth it. Um, I don't know if we want that rephrased in some way. I'm a little lost by it. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I, th I, I think I see what he means by ancestor memory. I mean, we all have this sense of, of history and... Uh, you know, if you're not uh, interested in reading sort of outside the accepted uh, uh, literature, right? Uh, we're all familiar with the textbooks we get in school, of course, our government schools. The standard textbooks uh, stay within a fairly narrow range. You're not going to see a lot of uh, revisionist history. So people do have this uh, sort of collective memory of what, uh, you know, what the, the early Americans did and thought and we, in the sense that we're part of that and carrying it on. That could then feed... Uh, you know, uh, people uh, people support for what is currently going on. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm catching the gist of the, the, the sentence uh, of the question, but I think I think that's along the lines that the questioner has in mind. We need to try to teach people. I know it's hard because we're really going up against a very core set of beliefs, and uh, people don't respond well to that. Uh, people often don't seek to go outside of their comfort zone and have their worldview challenged. That's that's one that's one thing libertarians that's a big handicap for libertarians to begin with. We're we're uh, we're, we're trying to yank people outside of their comfort zone and that's that's hard to do. Uh, a very good book in this regard is Brian Kaplan's The Myth of the uh, Rational Voter. I recommend that to people if you haven't read that. I haven't yet. I've been meaning to for a couple of years, but I'll it's make a note good. of that. Um All right. Let's see, here's a good one. Sam says, what should one do with all these warmongers who've never fought in a war? Put them against the wall. Besides that. Chick the chicken hawks. Well, I never fought in a war because I'm not a warmonger, so I guess I'm not covered by that. But, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm very proud that uh, I avoided Vietnam. <laughs> I know a few years ago there were people who used to, who, they used to call neoliberals, the people around the... Uh, uh, the old Washington Monthly, I guess that still exists, who were having guilty guilt feelings. They'd all gotten out of Vietnam because of uh, graduate deferments and things like that, uh, like Dick Cheney did, by the way. Uh, but they were feeling guilty about it. 
they were saying the test for our gen my generation came along and what did I do? I got student deferments and I, I'm now, you know, safely at the distance of, you know, 30 years later, I'm feeling very guilty about this. <laughs> I don't feel guilty about it. I didn't have a student deferment. I, uh, I, 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 I managed to, uh, to get a, a medical deferment, which didn't, uh, uh, you know, I had hay, hay fever and my doctor exaggerated it. I'll be honest about it. I guess I, guess I can't get in trouble. I guess I can't Sorry. get in trouble at this point. At this point, I, I assume the statute of limitations ran since that was like 1971. Uh, but maybe there is no statute of limitations. I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, where was I going with this? Uh, no, you know, pe there are people who fought in wars who are just as warmongering. So, you know, it's not only the chicken hawks that we have to worry about. Uh, now, it's true that some people who experience war say, you know, never again and let's not get into war. I mean, you've got great people like Andrew Basevich and others who, you know, who are really good and they've experienced war. And, and he not only did he experience war, he lost a son in Iraq. A horrible thing. Uh, and read his work. It's wonderful. I mean, he's he's a professor now and has great things to say about this 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 warrior ethic, this idea that um, somehow war is good for the nation. It stiffens the backbone and, you know, makes us all. I guess it can't make us all manly because half the population is not men, but you know it does something good to us. I don't know exactly what. Uh, <laughs> so it's not just the uh, yeah the warmongers who have never fought in a war, but um, it's certainly worth pointing out that it's very easy for someone who's never fought in a war to be sitting back and you know at his uh, at his word processor and uh, recommending that other people be sent off to war, especially especially when they're beyond the age when they're ever likely to get sent, even if a draft were reinstated. So. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the sentiment in the in this in the in the question. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's a horrible idea that you have to have fought in a war to say anything about it. But I do know uh, several people who went to war. Um, one friend in particular, he w he got to Iraq, and the moment he got there as a Marine, he he thought, "Oh, I shouldn't be here at all." And he actually got uh, Twitter angry Twitter comments because he criticized Chris Kyle, and I was like. Doesn't doesn't my friend get the, the sheen of the veteran to protect him from criticism? But apparently not, because Kyle is sort of higher on the hierarchy of soldier angels. That's interesting. Um, I'm a little curious about um, the Chris Kyle thing, and also the fact of the the the, the soldier. As, like, usually in abstract, you know, everyone supports the troops, but they often get sort of screwed over by VA bureaucracy and horrible PTSD and things like that. Mm -hmm. I just was sort of amazed by the Kyle thing where it had almost reached, like, a fever pitch of it. nothing about this matters except that this man was a soldier, an American soldier, and he's dead now, making him even more praiseworthy. Um... Yep. I, I, I guess I kind of want to ask you if, if, if did anything change with the way that we talk about soldiers? Um, like there, there was that Atlantic article last month where they talked about how um, the military used to have a more prominent role in American life, which obviously to us is a very bad thing. But there were you know more people were in the military. We had a draft during Vietnam. The military was not as distant and therefore was sort of more mockable from a cultural standpoint. And now. Everyone sort of feels guilty, and they put soldiers on a pedestal, but they sort of also ignore them. I mean, do you see a shift in the way soldiers are treated, even in your lifetime, even even with your knowledge of history? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure quite how to re how to talk about that because um, I'm not sure I really have identified the difference, even if I do have some sense that there is. I, I, it's definitely true that Vietnam was different because, you know, so many people, because of the draft, were, were touched by it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's different now. It's a much smaller percentage because we had a lot more people sent to Vietnam, even apart from the draft. Of course, the draft, I guess, made those numbers possible. What, what, a half a million at the height, I think. That's, I mean, that's incredible when we think about it. What was the top in... Uh, Afghanistan, you know, it was a hundred some thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, here, five hundred thousand. Uh, that sounds hard to believe, even to me. And I remember mm -hmm. watching it on the news every night and hearing about the body counts. And also, as I was ending my college career, 
wondering what was going to happen. Was I going to get <laughs> classified 1A? So, uh, but 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 now looking back, that you know from all the from you know this distance, uh, to to think that there were 500,000 people there, men, you know, in those days it was it was just men. You can say men safely, I guess, um, <laughs> and 58,000 uh, deaths. You know, uh, of Americans. Of course, that doesn't count the you know who knows how many uh, Vietnamese or not just Vietnamese. I was reminded, of course, Indo Chinese because of mm -hmm. uh, Cambodia and uh, La Laos. Uh, the war obviously spilled over there with U.S. bombing. Uh, I believe it's in the neighborhood of two million on the non-American side. Yeah, that's, that's the, the number. number, I remember. number. That's true. Yeah. And of course, people are still dying today because there's unexploded ordnance, right? They they drop cluster bombs and kids pick up these pick up the bomblets even to this day you can look online and find out the number per year because there's there are organizations devoted to finding those things uh, kids they're they're sometimes they're brightly colored kids will pick them up thinking it's some kind of toy and so i don't know what the number is but people are still dying as a result of these little gifts the united states left in, uh, in Indochina. So that's that's really amazing. It's, and it's sad that it's not even talked about in the media. Uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of mythology about how the this the uh, the military personnel were viewed as Vietnam ended and, and the people were coming home. Uh, it's fairly I mean, I, there's this story, which I think is largely myth and maybe entirely myth. That as soldiers came home, you know, were seen in airports, they were spat on and called baby killers. This has been investigated. This has been written about. There's a book uh, about it. I can't remember the title of it now. I saw it recently, uh, which says this did not happen. That doesn't mean there wasn't one person somewhere who who mistreated a soldier coming home. But this was not some kind of regular thing. Uh, and I think it's very hard to find. Uh, any evidence of it, like in the newspapers, it certainly would have been reported in newspapers if this, mm -hmm. this sort of thing had happened. Uh, and it didn't happen. So that's a mythology that's been built up because the Viet Vietnam be the War became unpopular and people wanted to get out. Uh, they weren't treating uh, the homecoming soldiers uh, the, w the way uh, uh, people who think, uh, uh, you know, the American people uh, uh, blew that war in a sense because it was such a it was such an obvious defeat. Uh, the, pe the people that still hold the American people responsible for the loss of that war want to smear them by saying, yeah, and yeah, look how they treated this, the returning uh, veterans. So I don't think there's a difference uh, between uh, now and then on how returning uh, veterans are being treated. I don't think because I don't think they were mistreated back then. I'm not talking about the VA. I'm talking about how just people were, you know, receiving them. Uh, but there is this distance. Yeah, definitely. This. In fact, there are, look, there are people today who want to re revive the draft. For that very reason, right, that not enough people are touched. When we go to war, not enough families are touched by it. Now, I think some people, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm against the draft under all circumstances, obviously. But someone who says, I, I want the draft because we'll get into fewer wars if we have one. I don't, we, you know, it didn't keep us out of Vietnam, obviously. But but at least, at least they have a good reason. You know, I don't approve of what they want, but at least the reason is they think it will keep us out of war. Other people still, you know, want the draft... And, and want to I go don't to really war. trust that argument. I've seen a lot of progressives make that argument, and I think yeah, it's Charlie very. Rang Charlie Wrangle makes it, but you're right. I, yeah, hmm. Maybe I'm too naive to try. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> a nice <laughs> idea that you think that would work, but how many pe how many people are going to die until you know uh, the Vietnam equivalent? Like, how long is it going to take before we go? Gee, this isn't working so well. So if you don't advocate for something evil to end evil. That's ridiculous. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> In this crowd, I know I can say that. Say that. <laughs> I wouldn't be misunderstood. <laughs> um, hmm. Let's see what we got here. I see a lot of questions. Hmm. Here's an interesting one. Um, Daniel, how many consonants? Quill, in that. I can't talk to you. I'm sorry. Let's say Daniel. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> that does help. Thank you. What relation... Sheldon, do you think there is between nationalism and professional sports entertainment? Are there any parallels? Um, which is also people get mad if you if you if you t insult sports and the military. So both. <laughs> uh, well, 
Well, so when you say if other than the obvious, I assume you mean you know we can't have a gathering at a, at a professional or even even an amateur uh, collegiate uh, sporting event without uh, you know saluting the troops and having a color guard on the on the on the field and thanking them for their service and maybe uh, planes flying overhead. Uh, so I assume that's what you mean by the obvious. Uh, do I think of sports as sort of uh, militaristic, like a, a microcosm or something symbolic of the, of the military? You know, well, football sort of lends itself to that, uh, but I, I wouldn't want to push that too far. Uh, so I'm not sure I see any real parallels other than the, the, those obvious ones. I think I, I have I, one. I, I, well, go ahead. Yeah, I, it's something I haven't thought a lot about, so you, you may go ahead. I'd like to hear you. Um, well, I mean, like, even my dear old minarchist dad has crankily said, you know, if you want – the brotherhood of the military than join a damned sports team. Um, the really not thinking about the politics, we just go to war and do what we're told type thing that even soldiers, this is the way, this is the way soldiers often look, will describe their experiences is that they were fighting for the man beside them. So there is a, a team and a brotherhood and I'm only doing it for you and it's not about the big grand picture thing. I don't know, there's something there I think that that could be sussed out with more work. All right, um, but, you know, because there's a big difference. You're not trying to kill the other team. Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, the, the difference is it, the difference is very clear. It's more that, um, you know, maybe we should all channel our impulse, our horrible nationalistic murderous impulses into sports. I don't really like sports, but well, I think that would be really is true that people, there are people who, like the neoconservatives, but not maybe not just them, who like war or, or and crisis because it brings us together, right? It makes us have a common purpose. They don't like – one reason they don't like sort of liberal bourgeois society uh, is that we're all sort of pursuing our own purposes. And we don't have this sense of, uh, you know, we're all in it together. Uh, William James – is it William James? William James uh, had the idea of, uh, of uh, mor the moral equivalent of war. After uh, well, actually, this before World War One, he wrote about this. But people thought of it during World War One and after. Uh, people who didn't have the stomach for war, they didn't like the bloodshed and the killing and all that. Still liked the solidarity. So they thought, well, how can we have that without war? So there are a lot of progressive thinkers, progressive capital P progressives, <coughs> who who thought if only we could have that without the blood and gore. Because you know that they were collectivists at heart, so they liked that we were all pulling together to, for a single, you know, single purpose. <coughs> Football, as, I mean, um, sports kind of gives you that. As terrifying as as the neocons are when they say that. Um, oh, well, I, I, was, I, I, I abandoned it, but I have to go back to it. I'm reading a book about war, dissidents in World War One, and it's amazing how many of the you know radical leftists. Brotherhood of working men across, you know, borders, doesn't matter, uh, suffragettes, all of these people, so many of them dropped the ball the moment it was time to go get the Hun. Um, it's rather shocking. Um, Pankhurst, the famous suffragette, she fell in the line with nationalism. Her one daughter did. Her one daughter did not, um, and there was a great rift between them. There was a lot of and same in the U.S., you know, with, with, we'll, we'll follow the line and maybe Woodrow Wilson will give us ladies the vote afterwards. It's just yeah. kind of amazing how how many supposed subversive people still, it's, we got to do it this time, that sort of thing. Yeah. <sighs> and the, the antidote for that is to read Randolph Bourne, right, who yes. knew all those people. Uh, the, those were all his friends and colleagues uh, before the war, and he saw them all, like John Dewey was a mentor of his, he saw them all going over to uh, Wilson's side in the war, and he broke with them, and he wrote some very uh, eloquent and passionate uh, you know, words about how you think you can steer this, you think it's, this is going to serve the cause of reform at home, you, you people don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're mounting a wild elephant thinking you're going to be able to direct it, and you know, it ain't going to happen. And, uh, you know, he was right and they were wrong. And then he died of Spanish flu, I guess. Um, yeah. And Wilfred Owen, Premature. my other favorite anti-World War One fellow, died a week before the armistice. So that's what war, war does to words that we need. All right. Um, 
uh, it would help me if I could figure out how to read these questions before I recklessly put them on air, but I'll put them on air. Uh, Darren Wolf wants to know, how do you counter the people that say we need an empire to protect our foreign trade? Ah, oh, yes. A good subject. Uh, you know, my friend Dan McCarthy, who's the editor of the American Conservative, uh, who's published me several times, uh, but recently had an article about how liberalism historically has needed an empire, first the British Empire and now the American Empire, and part of the idea was the protection of trade. Uh, I wrote a, a rebuttal uh, as one of my Friday TGIF articles. You can find it at uh, fff.org if you want to. Uh, I've read the title of it, actually, but search my name and McCarthy's name on our website, and you'll, you'll find it. Uh, well, that assumes, of course, there's no other way to protect foreign trade or that foreign trade all over the world is worth any cost, including an empire and all the baggage and bad things that that brings along. Uh, this, this prompts me to say that when you read American history, you realize that trade has always been a government program. Uh, you know, we have this idea that America in the early days was, uh, everyone was reading Adam Smith. And everybody was, uh, you know, for free markets and uh, an and anti-empire. But it's just not true. I don't know how many people read, read Adam Smith in those days. You know, maybe maybe uh, uh, maybe Jefferson did. Don't forget, the book came out in 1776, so they were busy. Maybe they didn't get a chance to read it right away. <laughs> but uh, they were more, they were fairly mercantilistic, right? The first, look, the first uh, Revenue Act of the first Congress, July 4th, 1789, was a tariff. Across the board, comprehensive tariff, high tariff on, on just about everything, uh, and uh, and the New York paper, one of the New York papers called it the Second Declaration of Independence. So, wow, <laughs> this was not a free trade nation. Uh, we embargoed we embargoed uh, other countries, you know, at the drop of a hat. Jefferson put embargoes on France and England. He called embargoes peaceful coercion. Okay, so uh, we don't just get gobbledygook these days from uh, politicians. They had it back then, too. Uh, so tr so trade in the U.S. was always seen as something uh, directed by government. So even the ones that wanted globalization expected the, it would, the government to open up the foreign markets, to have a big navy and go out and open up the markets. Uh, the fur traders like Astor, you know, they, they expected the state to do the opening of the markets, not just offering their wares and see if anybody is willing to buy them. The state was supposed to do it. Well, the state is force, right? The state is the military, and it's the threat to use force, which the U.S. was always willing to do. Uh, and this went even, in, you know, to Asia. They were they wanted to open uh, China. Uh, they wanted a route to the Pacific so they would have the you know gateway to to China to open trade. And they saw everybody else's arrival. Uh, so. Uh, if, if you say to me, but if we don't have an empire, I'm not saying the questioner is uh, arguing this. I understand you're just asking the question. But I would say to someone like McCarthy or someone else who, who, who thinks we need an empire in order to have trade, if, not having, if, if, if we don't have, an, if we need an empire to have you know, trade all around the world, then I'm willing to give up trade, having trade all around the world. Okay, that's not a price I think libertarians should want to pay or anybody should want to pay because there's going to be a high cost in freedom. And, and we know that the empire isn't going to be, you know, limited to just one thing, <laughs> keeping the sea lanes open. You can't trust politicians to, you know, just to do that one thing. We know public choice and other, other uh, schools of thought and theories give us plenty of reason to know, even if uh, you tell them, okay, here's the only thing you're allowed to do, Mr. Empire Keeper, keep the sea lanes open. That's not all that's all that's going to happen. So I would say let, let the market figure out a way to keep the sea lanes open. And if trade isn't global, okay, so um, trade's not global. That, the way that that's phrased reminds me of sort of the the the, the other side of, of that that I've heard from my um, social anarchist, left, extra left anarchist, but, you know, the sort of black hoodie clad type, my cousin, um, and I know you like markets, you know, markets and not capitalism and all that. But his whole thing is that I think basically that to trade abroad inherently is going to give us empire and warfare. That, you know, the blood part is is inherent. And I that doesn't seem to be right to me. But it's interesting that sort of, oh, I guess like the neocon and he could almost agree that there's a, yep. a balance there. 
Well, that's a position taken. That's a position that fear is held by some paleocons. I mean, maybe all paleocons. Pat Buchanan has actually said that. The reason he doesn't, you know, he'll say that one reason I don't like globalization. I'm not saying he may have other reasons. But he'll say with globalization will come, mm -hmm. the, we'll need the empire. We're not going to have one without the other. Uh, and I, I'm not going to just quickly dismiss that. I mean, I think that's given, Amer especially given the American approach to trade, which has always been, you know, led, spearheaded by the government. Uh, he's right to be concerned about that. And there's a phrase that came out of leftist literature called, the, the, uh, the phrase is uh, free trade imperialism. I mean, the U.S. used free trade as a banner to force open, you know, with gunboat diplomacy and dollar diplomacy, force open foreign markets, not just let business people go out and try to sell their, their, their uh, you know, and negotiate privately to try to open up markets and find customers. That's not what yeah. free trade has meant in the United States. We may mean it. Uh, that's what we might mean. That's what Cobden meant. But and he and he would have uh, been on our side on this. But for an awful lot of people, it means no. The government goes out and pries open markets using force if it has to. So I don't. I I think the the, the uh, Buchanan concern is interesting and something to be uh, closely thought about. And uh, and we have to make it clear by. But when we talk about global free trade, we don't mean spearheaded by the uh, you know the that, U.S. Navy. Um, that's a good answer. I will tell my cousin that you said that and. Uh, I've been trying to use you as a selling point, like, you're like, I'm a libertarian, I'm okay, and this Sheldon Richmond fellow, he's okay, <laughs> so I'll get him yet. <laughs> Let's see, all right, we've got more questions. Um, <laughs> you're doing good work. <laughs> I'm trying my best. <laughs> oh, here we, all right, here we go. Um, wait, no, am I failing here? No, I got it, I got it. Don't panic. There it is. Okay, good. <laughs> I, see, I see it. All right, so Ken J uh, is thanking you, and that's good. Um, and he has a proper question, <laughs> which is, what do you believe is the best antidote, um, antidote for the poison, the one that's nationalism, uh, which is a good general question. Yeah. Uh, well, the best antidote is for us to go out and teach people. Uh, you know, and always in a polite, respectful way. Uh, but we need to write articles. And, and those of us who, you know, who, if you're not a writer, I mean, just find your own way in your conversations with friends and family. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, I appreciate that you thank me for my work at Fee. Let's let's remember uh, Leonard, the model Leonard Reed uh, said, I think, for all of us as being eloquent advocates of our of our position on behalf of liberty. But, you know, that meant uh, not being obnoxious, don't hit people over the head, don't insult them. Uh, I would say, that, you know, don't call them hypocrites uh, every chance you get. <laughs> uh, first of all, try to see things from their point of view. You know, don't forget, we, none of us were born understanding all of this, right? We had to learn it at one point. Uh, and so uh, that's true of the person you're talking to. So be patient and try to understand, uh, you know, what their context is and how they're, how they're seeing things. And then, and then use... You know, respectful, polite ways to point out an inconsistency in their thinking, and or, or doesn't this thinking then lead to uh, antagonism of uh, people who are not of your nationality, and then possible conflict? And what you know, aren't people aren't people people? Isn't there one moral code for all for all people, including the people in government? Uh, you know, there's those kinds of uh, sort of soft sell ways to get people to rethink their position. But people are naturally defensive of the position they they hold. Uh, certainly, if it's something they grew up with and heard from an, you know an early age and have uh, uh, not questioned. So if you come on, you know if you come sort of uh, at them uh, aggressively, th their natural uh, response, and it's totally understandable, is going to be to be defensive and, and put up their defenses and not hear what you're saying. Uh, so we have to find good ways to talk to people and, and write for people who are not not already convinced of all. And you got to have infinite yeah. patience. I, I, I um, that's the sense that I get. Yeah. Uh, but but don't forget, you know, in, in Western in Western tradition, Western philosophical tradition, moral tradition, there there while there's a lot of nationalism, there's also there is also a universalist strand. 
that we get from the Greeks, right? From the Greek philosophers. That that's uni that's universalist. That, that there's one code for everybody. It applies to everybody. Uh, I'm not saying they practice this fully. Obviously, they had slavery, and Aristotle even endorses slavery. So I'm not talking about the inconsistencies, but the philosophies themselves are uh, are universal, right? They they don't they don't. It's not that each country has its own ethic and it doesn't apply to any people on the other side of the boundary. So we we can tap into that because everybody has some of that in them as well. I think there's tension for most people in these issues, right? They're they're nationalistic because they think, well, that's patriotism and that I have to be loyal to my country. After all, it's my country. But at the same time, there's still part of them. Some of it may come from religion or it could be secular. That's also universalist. And so we need to bring out the good and, and show them that the, the other side is inconsistent with the good. It's a Socratic thing, really. Um, Socrates did. Just think about nationalism again. Um, this is another one of my side notes. I feel indulge me. Um, my excuse to talk to Sheldon Richmond audience. Haha, ha. I'm benefiting too. Um, obviously, I'm a horrible um, radical in most circles. But every once in a while in anarchist circles, I feel like I'm almost, almost too nice to the United States, if only because I have this lingering, like, hurt feelings that the United States is not what it professes to be. You know, it has those lovely sounding fanning documents. Um, obviously, they had some slavery and other problems, but like, the more you discover about it, that it's not what it is. And I, I saw um, a woman who escaped North Korea give a speech at Students for Liberty last weekend. And obviously, she's in the United States, and thank God for that. Her life will be a thousand times better now. But I always wish the United States could just be the Berlin Walls falling and David Hasselhoff's there and... <laughs> You know, immigrants are coming in, and they, it, it's all going to be great. I just, I don't, I, I guess I honestly want to know if anyone else or has or used to have this feeling that, that just, you know, they got, as Johnny Rotten said, did you ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Like, I don't know. This is, I don't know if this makes sense, but I, I, I don't know. I have a fondness for America. It's geographical niceness, and it's murder ballads, and I wish it was anything like it says it is. Uh, well, I didn't hear a question. I just kind of wanted to share with you. the class. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to disagree chair. with me or call me a status, that's fine, too. Um, um, we have, you know, do we have any other questions? I mean, we, we can let you go. Technically, we're supposed to do an hour, but I was told we could you know, rail against the state all night long. I can take a couple, I, I can all take right. a couple of more minutes. All right, well, I'll make it a good more. one. It's getting late for me. Let's see. I don't know if this is redundant from Daniel, but um, just if you elaborate a hair more on on talking to people specifically about going against nationalism and nationalistic ideology. Um, for example, you know, Christians, I, I, I always appreciate a Christian who who is very offended by the idolatry of, um, you know, worshiping the flag and that sort of thing. Um, and the sort of transubstantiation of I fought for the flag, you know, it literally is the nation. Um, and I'm sorry, Daniel, I'm paraphrasing here, but given, given, you know, the fact that most people go to public school and they learn all of these very authoritarian civic values, how do you begin to tell somebody that they're, you know, wrong in the most awful and harmful sort of way? Well, it's hard to answer in the abstract because, you know, it, uh, it really helps to have the person in front of you to hear what they're saying, how they're phrasing things. Uh, you take cues from the other person. So the, it's hard to give just blanket advice, you know, to how to talk to, you know, just anybody that comes along. Uh, I would just say try to see how they're seeing it. First of all, be very sensitive to the language they use. Ask them questions to draw them out. That's also a way to uh, have them put their defenses down, show interest in their 
in their point of view, which you should be if you're interested in trying to get them to change it. You should be interested in what it is first that you're trying to change. So that, I think, will cause people to let their defenses down a little bit. And, and then you can have a real connection. That's the important thing. You've all, we've all been in – libertarians, of course, have always, always gotten into these conversations with people, arguments with people, uh, where, you know, it's just like butting heads and you leave feeling like crap, right? And so probably the other person does too. No one's gotten anywhere. There's been no meeting in the minds. Uh, you know, not only has nobody convinced anybody, but you don't even the, the other person doesn't even understand your position. That's what makes you feel worst of all. It's not so much uh, that, you, that the, you didn't bring them around to your point of view. You feel like you made no progress in getting them even to see what your point of view is. So there's no chance. Uh, so you we, we avoid that at all costs. And and part of that I think means. Be interested in what the other person is saying. Try to understand it. Don't come out of the, you know, out of the gate like a horse, you know, a horse, a race horse. You're just immediately charging at them. Uh, lay, you know, hang back. Get them to talk. I mean, this, you know, think, read some of Plato's dialogues. I mean, I think this is really very useful. Uh, Socrates, Socrates didn't walk through the agora. And start attacking people as being hypocrites and uh, you know they don't know what they're talking about and how can you say that he starts to he draws them out you know he says well how do you define justice well, he gets them to say what they mean by that and then he says yeah but what about this wouldn't this be wouldn't this be wrong and therefore it does not conflict with what you just said and he gets them then thinking like okay yeah i gotta kind of do this adjustment of my two views to see how i can if i can bring them into some equal, kind of equilibrium uh, uh we need more of that because i don't think we get anywhere when we just Attack people and call them statists. Most people no, don't even don't. know what that term means, right? Uh, or looters. I mean, I'm, I'm drawing, you know, I did a, an article a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, TGIF at feed, uh, FFF.org, about a talk uh, Nathaniel Brandon gave at the 1979 Libertarian Party convention. And in that article, you'll find a link to the audio uh, file, the MP3. You can listen to it. It's really worth listening to. But I, I quote it, and so you'll get a Good sense, I think, of what what he said, even if you don't listen to it. But I do recommend you listen to it. And he talks about this. He talks about how to talk to non-libertarians. Uh, and remember, it's self-evident to you today wasn't always self-evident to you. So don't get mad at people if it's not self-evident to them today. Uh, you know, give them a break. <laughs> you know, we were all non-libertarians at one time. Nobody in the crib started <laughs> uh, quoting Rothbard that I know of. I've never heard of anybody. I certainly didn't figure all this stuff out for myself. I had to read a lot of people and talk to people and question people and go back and forth with myself before it started to make sense. So, you know, have some uh, have some compassion for other people who have not uh, come uh, in contact with it uh, uh, yet or only just now, you know, uh, encountering it because of you. And so be, uh, yeah, be compassionate and, uh, and, and be... I'm repeating myself, I realize, but be interested in what it is they're saying and, you, and let them talk. And, you know, I know what happens because I've done it a zillion times myself. We have all have this little file cabinet in our heads and we hear a couple of key words from the person, right? If it's the minimum wage or war, and we immediately go riffling through, right, the little box of index cards and say, okay, he said minimum wage, Psh, I pull out my minimum wage speech and you immediately go off to the races again, you know, giving your little spiel on minimum wage. You got to really listen, like any, any good conversation. Um, and I, I got, I'm listen. reminded of Dave Barry, um, who was totally my favorite, you know, person to read, but even before I was libertarian, and he, when he describes arguing with you, and he absolutely describes it in that way, that he railed and you let him rail and eventually he was like hmm maybe maybe he's right so listen to sean and richmond on this one as well people because when you everyone always says when you're having you know you're never going to change anyone's mind and that's simply not true it is possible um we just tend to do it very badly i think <laughs> yeah and it's very nice of, it was very nice of dave to actually remember all that and when he was interviewed in reason some years ago they said how'd you become a libertarian he actually you know he was famous by then he'd won a pulitzer prize and everybody loved him because he was such a great he's such a great humorist still still is of course uh he actually told the, an accurate story 
he gave me the credit. We used to sit in the back. We were both reporters in a county outside of Pennsylvania, small papers, and we covered the same town councils and things like that. And we both sat in the back and made fun, fun of them. But I was making affirmative libertarian points, and he was just taking pot shots at them, and making fun. Right? He was just a critic, and he scoffed at my my views at first. And then we went our separate ways. And one day I got a letter from him, and he said, "You were right." It really That's did start great. that way. He said, "You were, you were right." <laughs> I should have, I should have retired at that point because you know, where do I go from there? Hey, I converted Dave Barry. You took me from minarchist to anarchist, so that's good too. <laughs> and you and uh, Anthony Gregory uh, share that, the credit uh, or the the lack of that, whatever, whatever that is. It was you too. <laughs> Indeed, can be, he can. Anthony can be very persuasive. Um, <laughs> And he's one of the most thoughtful yeah, means, people I know. If you want to talk about war, means too, wars, definitely. he's the person. That um, I think we can wrap up. I kind of, I have one other question that I, I'm going to see if I can formulate to you, um, which is back, trying to get back to the whole poisonous nationalism thing. Um, realistically, probably, if we're going to get to our libertopia, it's going to be incremental and the switch won't be given to us, so we won't have to choose whether to flick the switch. But can you speak on sort of how you can yeah. defang nationalism in, in sort of a minarchist world, in sort of an incremental way, you know, before before we get to where we want to go? Is there a way to, you know, maybe we have this small and smaller state. How do we, you know, sort of further discredit it and, and keep it, you know, in its place? When you say discredit it, you mean... Well, I guess both, or, I or suppose, natural? yeah. Just so I'm clear. Well, yeah. Well, I think... I think uh, you know, I think people are already about 50% libertarian. And by that I mean, and maybe more than that. Uh, it's an, another article I did uh, a couple of years ago. Uh Michael Humer makes a good point. He, he, you know, he's he's a libertarian philosopher. Has written a very good book on the question of political authority, and uh, and he's not the first to say this. I'm certainly not the first to say anything like this. But most people, of course, in their own private lives, would never do what they think it's okay for the state to do, right? They would never go to their neighbor with a gun and say, "Give me, uh, you know, 20 percent of your income because I want to help homeless people." They wouldn't think to do that. Not only because they get, they know they'd get arrested for you know robbery, but they just, they know most people know that that's just not a legitimate thing to do, even if they could get away with it. They don't think it's, they know that's not right. Uh, so the, so we, we can start with that. Okay, they 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 are libertarians pretty much in their own lives, most people. So we can start with that, and, and again, in a Socratic way, ask them, well, what makes the people in office different? Why is the government allowed to do that, that stuff? Uh, when if you and I did it, we all know it would be a, considered a crime, and an offense against innocent people. Uh, I think that's a good way to begin, to get people thinking, because they'll, they have to come up with a reason for why they think it's different if the government does it, but then we then address that. Is it the fact that we voted? Okay, well, so what if my block votes that the, uh, you know, that, that I can go and steal at gunpoint money? You know, they wouldn't accept it just because we had some kind of vote. So you can, I think you can begin to get people to question it. It doesn't mean you're going to convince them on the spot in that first session, but you get them thinking, and I think that's what we have to do. We have to get them thinking about deeply held views that they learn from a young age and have not ever seen. That's questions. a good answer. That's a good general advice. That's my general advice. Um, I think we can wrap up. Do you have any final thoughts? Otherwise, I can start promoting various things. No, I think I'll let you do that. I don't want to just repeat myself, and uh, I'm afraid that's what I'll do if I Okay, well, thank you thoughts. so much for doing this. Um, I had a lot of fun and shamelessly exploited it for my own need to pester you with things. But hopefully it was worthwhile for... I'm glad. I, 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 um, I guess everybody in the world should go look at um, fff.org. <laughs> um, go check out F Free Association. 
which is your personal blog. Um, uh, you've written several books we didn't even get to, which, you know, one could find on Amazon. Bless you, Mike. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, books on separating school and state and welfare reform, which is I now have a copy of. Um, and there was a third one that I'm blanking on. Yeah, the income tax, uh, your money or your life, they're all available on Thank Kindle you. or, you know, e-books now. <laughs> That's very helpful. Um, I guess this is officially can be wrapped up. We have lots of exciting Liberty.me things coming up, including I think I'm supposed to do Bourbon and Bitches in approximately an hour and a half, so y'all can tune in for that if you want. Um, I'm now, I, <laughs> I guess, okay. Um we have a Bitcoin thing coming up tomorrow, and I think that Bitcoin is a lovely topic for the opposite of nationalism, which is good. Um, yeah, I think we'll just I'll just stop my stammering here and now. Sheldon, thank you again so much uh, for coming. This was great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for for coming out. Thanks for your questions. Yes. See, See you again, Sheldon, uh, again next, next month. month. Thank you, audience. You've been lovely. Goodbye, everybody. Good night.